Hello everyone, this is the uh, Docker EE Advanced Access Control. Uh, it will be presented by Mark Church. Mark um, is a solutions architect for Docker and tweets under Church of Mark. If you have any church jokes, he probably hasn't heard them all, so go for it. Tweet all church jokes at Church of Mark. So I'm Mark, thank you guys for coming, and I appreciate you guys coming to the last session of the day. I know access control isn't exciting for everybody, um, but it's very exciting to me, personally, and if you're in the wrong session, well, it's too late, we've already locked the doors, so you're gonna have to stay. We're gonna talk about LDAP for the next 40 minutes, so I hope you guys are excited about that. But in all honesty, access control uh, has a lot of implications in what we do every day. It's not just about who has access to what and what people can see. Access control is one giant step closer towards uh, self-service infrastructure. It's one step closer towards automating our infrastructure. And it's one big step towards um, also multi-container infrastructure. And the point is that if, if, um, if access control is easy to understand and easy for you to implement without too much overhead, then you're actually going to use it. And it's going to, it's going to empower your users rather than take access away from them. And just like open source software has given power to developers and able, enabled them to do bigger things with a, better access control where you can actually uh, give granular control to, to the exact things that you need to give control for, you can empower your users to use your container infrastructure and to gain a lot of value out of that. So let's talk about how we got here in the first place. So sharing is caring. We've all learned that at one point or another, I hope, right? Either in kindergarten or from your, your family. Sharing is caring. And why are we so bad at this in IT? So virtualization allowed us to share our hardware infrastructure, but at the same time, why are we not sharing our container infrastructure? So let me share a little bit about what I've seen over the last couple years. Docker is four years old now, and we've worked with a lot of different companies. And what I see a lot of times is with container technology specifically, the technology springs up within companies in all kinds of different locations, right? All, all at the same time. So there's one team that starts deploying one tool, another team starts a couple months later, and they have a different tool, and everybody has a different strategy. And of course, you know, one team is using Puppet to deploy containers, another one's using Kubernetes, Swarm, Mesosphere, and so on. And this really becomes a problem when the, the next application comes on board and the, and the team doesn't trust their container infrastructure enough to onboard multiple teams using the same area. And so what do they do? They spin up a new cluster. And then you have multiple clusters and you have overhead of managing all these things. You have configuration drift and all these kinds of issues. And it's like Oprah where you get a cluster and you get a cluster and everybody gets a cluster. And the problem with that is that it's just not scalable. It's not scalable for organizations who, ha who plan on using containers and having that spread across their entire organization. Now, shared infrastructure does two things for us. And the first one's fairly obvious, right? It allows us to have more, uh, a better utilization of resources. We have a larger pool of resources that we use. We can put a larger pool of applications on that. And things fit nicely together and things are a little more efficient. The second one is a little more nuanced. It's about a separation of concerns and a specialization of, kit of skills. And so if you, can, um, if you have a larger container infrastructure that a and it's a common platform for people to use, well then you can have people specialize in specific areas. And so you can understand very well what your container primitives are and how they work and how the, what the infrastructure is. On the other hand, your application developers don't have to understand how the infrastructure works. They simply have to understand what the primitives are and how they can use them. And so your developers can focus on developing applications and not setting up Kubernetes or anything like that. So what kind of resources are we talking about specifically here when we're talking about Docker Enterprise? Well, there's a lot of different resources, right? And these kind of fall into two buckets of physical resources and virtual resources. Where physical resources are things like hosts themselves and the, the resources within them, so you know, CPU and memory. And then we also have virtual resources, primitives that have special importance or meaning to us, things like secrets and networks. And then also containers themselves. 
And so access control is really, is the resources in uh, Docker are really about controlling access to who can see these things, who can use these things, who can create them, who can destroy them, and also where containers can connect to, what, what networks containers can connect to, and everything else. So it's, it's very broad, and it's very, um, there's a large set of resources, and really defines um, a lot of things in which how applications are deployed. So um, let me bring up UCP, and I'm going to show you guys an example of, of reality, what I see in a lot of organizations. Of course, not your organization, just the other guys. And let me see here. So bring up the right one. So this is UCP. So everything I'm showing you guys today, by the way, is in the current version of UCP 2.2. This is, there's nothing roadmap in this discussion. Um, I'm going to show you guys the users that we have in every organization. What do we have? We have an admin user, right? And they have admin rights. And then we have literally everybody else. And how does this happen? Well, it happens because we have one person, right? They're on your team. They set up your cluster six months ago. They have admin rights. They left your team. They don't even know they still have admin rights. And then you have other users that helped out with this. So there's a couple admins. And then everybody else who is asking, asking for uh, resources just because they know the person or anything like that. And so the, the issue here is the contract that you have about access to resources is, imp is implied by the relationship between people, whether they sit next to each other or whether they're on the same team or whether they're buddies. Um, and, and that's a huge problem, right? Because people are squishy and they ask for PTO, but most importantly, you can't put an API in front of them and we can't control this. We can't automate the access control process. Why does this happen? Well, this happens for two reasons. Um, one, Either your platform doesn't provide you the features that are granular enough for what you need to get done, right? It doesn't map to your organization. It doesn't give you the specific capabilities that you need to toggle things on or off. Or two, it's so comprehensive and so large that you don't understand it. it has, there's too much maintenance to actually operate it, and so you're not going to in your organization. But this leaves us in the same place, right? It leaves us with um, a, an an RBAC structure that doesn't meet our organization, and it doesn't do the kind of things that we need to do. And so, without further ado, let's get into the specifics. Let's talk about a specific design scenario. So, I'm going to bring up my favorite customer, my favorite fictional customer, that is, Orca Bank. So, of course, I couldn't have a presentation without a whale in it. I think that's a Docker requirement. Um, so, access control at Orca Bank. So, um, we're going to go through here, and we're going to just dive in, and we're going to basically create their entire access control scenario in, um, in UCP. And so in their situation, they have two independent development teams, right? So we have a payments team that operates on a, a payments application, and then we have a mobile team that do the back end for mobile. These are separate teams, but they're using common infrastructure. We have administrators that need to administrate and operate on the entire stack, all the way from the nodes uh, through the container infrastructure, so they, they manage everything. And then we have an ops team that is responsible for deploying applications on behalf of the payments and mobile teams. Um, they have uh, domain and control over the application nodes, but they're still not responsible for, um, the, uh, for the container infrastructure itself. So we have a couple different personas here, right? So we have um, different people that have different access controls. So obviously, roles are of very big importance. And roles in, in Docker Enterprise, um, obviously it's an RBAC system, so roles are kind of fundamental to that. So we're going to th create three different roles. And the way that roles work in UCP is it's very granular. We go down to the Docker API level. So you can control things like you know, Docker stop, Docker restart, Docker service logs, Docker network create. All these things are individual actions that you can combine together in custom roles. And so for administrator, uh, we have a built-in admin role. So that's what the administrators will take our ops role. It's going to be a role that we're going to create ourselves, a custom role, and it's going to use different actions, except when they're not going to be able, we don't want them to be able to add or remove nodes or do things to, the, to that level of infrastructure, but they can deploy applications and create virtual networks and things like that. From a dev perspective, well, this is our application that's in production, but our developers know the most about the application. We need to give them the ability to view containers, inspect things about the container, and also get container logs. But at the same time, we don't want them to be able to do anything to the container or to disrupt any kind of resources or change anything. So with this granularity, we get a whole lot of power, and it's really great. But at the same time, we're not going to blanket give access to a team to the entire cluster, right? That's too black and white. We need to segment resources in some way so that, um, so that these roles can apply to just a subset of applications or whatever nodes we want to do. 
And that's where collections come into play. So collections are another primitive that's in the access control system. Essentially, they're a grouping of resources. So we can take um, different resources like network secrets and containers and workers themselves and put a box around them and say, this is what we're going to give access against with this specific role. Now, what's powerful about collections is that they're hierarchical. And so in that way, we can actually give more specific and even more specific access to a specific group of resources. Um, it's very powerful, and it, in going through the design process with different customers, I haven't found a use case yet in which we can't match a collection hierarchy against some organizational structure. Now, this helps us do two things, right? It helps us uh, not have to go with, uh, create weird exceptions and rules like that to get the access control you want. And then also, it maps very cleanly to, um, to the kinds of uh, organizational structure that you would have in your team so that we don't have to put people in multiple teams and things like that. Okay, so I think you guys get it. So let's put it all together. Let's put it all together. Uh, put it all together. There we go. Grants. So grants are taking these concepts and rolling it into which is essentially an access control list um, role for your cluster. And so we have two legs that we already know, right? We have the collection, we have the role, but the, and then we also have the subject. And the subject is the who. So the grant defines who can access which resource and what, uh, what capabilities they have against that. Um, and we create grants individually. Now the powerful thing about grants is that they very clearly show who has access to what. And so uh, it's, it's, it makes the system much more maintainable. It means that you, uh, you act, your security team can actually go and say, you know, who, who can view these containers, who can do these kinds of actions against containers. And so even when I approach a fresh UCP cluster, uh, you can see that the administrator has full rights against the entire cluster. And that's, I'll show you guys that right now. It's very easy to see. So if I click on grants over here, um, I can see that my admin has full control against root. So that's the entire cluster. It's very easy to uh, conceptualize how that works. Okay, so let's go back to uh, pseudo reality at Orca Bank. Just review this again. The admins have uh, capability of the entire stack to do everything. Ops team can deploy applications on behalf of the development teams. And the development teams can view their containers only just for troubleshooting purposes. So let's go back to the concept of collections for a second. What exactly, what kind of collection architecture would we want to have? Well, clearly we would want to have our um, infrastructure nodes in some kind of collection where only the admins have access to. So we have a system collection for UCP controllers and DTR nodes and everything else. And then we have a collection for one development team, a mobile team. And then we have a payments collection. And voila, if we put it all together, we're actually utilizing the hierarchy here. And there's two terms that, you might have not, that we haven't discussed yet. So there's a system collection, capital S system, and then capital S shared. And then these are two default collections that we have in UCP that automatically puts infrastructure nodes under system and then everything else, every other kind of resource against shared. And so that's when you start off, it basically segments things for you and you can create new collections that actually that, um, have a, a, that, that follow right up to the root where you can put different nodes in, things like this. But this is the default setting right here. You put everything underneath shared and then you can segment from there. Now, let's look at, if we take a look at the file structure, if we just look at it from a folder perspective, this looks very familiar, right? So we have a root folder that contains our child collections underneath that. We have our infrastructure nodes and system. And, but there's one kind of nuance point here is that we have our application nodes underneath shared, yet the mobile and payments collections underneath that. And what this means is that we're gonna have, we're gonna be sharing uh, physical nodes or virtual nodes by the mobile and payments teams. So their, their containers and every, every other kind of resource is gonna get deployed on those nodes, but they themselves won't be able to see the other virtual resources, even though they'll be sharing the infrastructure. Um, we can, of course, separate nodes and have them scheduled separately for different collections, but we're gonna get to that later. Okay, so I think you guys get it now, so let's put it all together. This is a little bit of an eye chart, but let's read this from right to left. So we have our individual users, so admins, that are gonna be on a team. That team is gonna get a grant against the team that's gonna have the full control role against the entire cluster, right, the root. And then we have our SREs or ops people that are gonna be an ops team. They're gonna have the ops role against the shared collection. 
And so that's, they can deploy anything in the shared collection, right? But then our developers can only, deploy, or can only view containers with their dev role in their own specific collection, right? In the shared payments collection or the shared mobile collection. All right, so I tried really hard to keep PowerPoint slides to a minimum, and I've, I've utterly failed at that. But now let's actually go to UCP, and we'll configure some of these components. Okay, so I'm on the um, Orca Bank UCP instance right here. So let me just show you guys a few things, and before I get this question, because I know it'll come up if I don't address it. I have, I've pulled in all my uh, users and with LDAP, so I've configured that. I've an open, open LDAP container running, and I've got the Orca Bank organization being pulled in. Additionally, I've got all the teams being pulled in as well, um, so all the members are, are using that. So obviously, you want to use your own auth backend to have this stuff all set up, and then have that be pulled in, um, so you don't have to, so there's no manual configuration of that. And if I look at my users, I could see I've got a couple different users here. Right? I've got Ashley the admin, Mindy the mobile developer, and Peter the payments developer. I'm going to go over to my organizations and teams. I have an organization called Orca Bank, and within that I have a mobile ops and payments team, with which those users have been pulled into on respectively. One thing I've also created is I've already created collections beforehand. Here are our two default collections, shared and system, that follow up to, up to the root of the cluster. If we, go in, if we dive into the shared collection, we can see here are our mobile and payments collections. So this follows the hierarchy that we showed earlier. Okay, cool. So these are our default grants that are in here. When people log in, they have access to their own specific shared collection. Um, which we can turn off as well. We can just say blank, get access. No, we don't give you any access unless it's explicitly granted. So let's go ahead and actually create some of these grants so we can illustrate the access control at work. So first, I'm going to uh, create a grant for the ops team. I'm going to say I want to have, I want to select the collection against the shared collection so they can deploy anything there. The role that they're going to use is the uh, operator role and the subject is going to be Orca Bank and then the ops team, of which there's one person on, it's a very lonely team. Okay, so we're gonna create that. And really quickly, I wanna show you guys the roles I have. So on here, I can see this is the operator role. And over here, we've got all the different things that they can do, right? Create configs, container attach. Um, you, you can get very specific, right? We can, we can specify whether they can, they can deploy or use um, host bind mounted volumes or what they can do with what types of networks they can connect to, whether it's overlay or bridge or host mode or something, something else. So that's very granular. So that's the role that we've given to our ops team member right here. Let's create the roles for the other, or let's create the grants for the other two teams. So I'm gonna go down into the payments collection. I'm gonna select that. The role I'm going to give them is developer. Boom, so that grant is created, and the next one. This is for the mobile team, also developer. Now, obviously, everything here um, can be done through API. I've set up everything else through API. Um, so we typically don't expect users, when they're setting up their UCP cluster, to be going in through the GUI. But it does make for nice demos. So let's log in as um, Omar, the ops guy. So I'm going to sign out, and he's going to deploy an application. Wi-Fi, please work. So first thing we notice is Omar is an ops person, so they, they're already missing a tab because they're not administrators, so they can't administrate um, access policies within the cluster or anything like that. Um, what he can do is uh, he can deploy applications, obviously. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to deploy a couple applications on behalf of our uh, on behalf of the development teams. So he's going to create a service right here. We're just going to call one payments app image. Just a very simple image. We can see we have this collection tab right here, and so we're gonna select the collection. 
And so he has access to a lot of different collections. Now we can also default to a specific collection. So we can say for a user, you will by default always deploy your applications or whatever resources you have into a specific collection. So we're going to select the uh, payments one right here. And we're going to create that. And then next, we're going to do the, pay the mobile app. And we're select the mobile collection and then deploy that. Okay, great. So those will be coming up in a second. Let's log in as Mindy, who is on the uh, mobile development team, and let's see what she sees. Okay, so Mindy, um, she can go here, and of course she sees only one service, only the one that's actually deployed for her team. So there's the mobile app. And if she needs to click on it, she can do things, obviously, like inspect it. So let's go in here and let's inspect the containers. So we can see all the information there. We can see that the container is deployed into the shared mobile collection. Um, let's view the logs for this container. OK, so she can see the logs. That's cool. Um, let's see what happens when she tries to restart it. Oh, and she's denied. So access is denied, no access to container restart on the specific collection that she's in, right? So that's expected. Um, nothing really crazy there. So let's do something now. Of course, we have we expect you know system accounts and users, especially developers, not to be using the GUI. They're probably going to be using the command line. That makes a lot more sense. So that's what the client bundle is for. So the client bundle allows us to um, uh, so basically set the, set the context for a Docker client so we can connect to our cluster, and then we can view all the resources in that way. So I'm going to get over here and uh, let's see, what was that called again? Cool. So now Mindy from the command line can just see the resources that she has access to. And so if she wants to, you know, Docker inspect the container, oh, that's not it. She can do that. There we go. Um, if she wants to look at the Docker logs, she can do the same thing. Now, what if she wants to a uh, Docker exec into it? Right? This is really common. A developer might want to get into the container to look at the file system or some you know, mess with the configuration file. Um, Obviously, we're going to get blocked, right? So no access to container exec, because if she has container exec capabilities, well, then she has the capability to potentially bring the container down. We're not going to do that with applications in production. However, let's say that we needed to for some reason or whatever. Um, if we needed to do that, well, it's fairly simple to change the access policies here. So I'm going to sign in as an admin again. Say so Mindy is the only person that knows about this application. She needs to go in and do some troubleshooting, so we need to allow her to get into the container. Maybe if it's a staging cluster, this is something you would allow by default. Um, so we're going to go to user management. We're going to go to the grants. And let's create a grant just for Mindy, um, just on the specific collection, because we don't want to give her blanket access to do this everywhere. So we're going to select the mobile collection. For the roles, we're going to give her container exec. So she can do that. And the subject, we're just going to specify her as a user. So Mindy Mobile Developer. And we'll create that grant. So that, that now exists here. And if we go back to our command line, let's see if Mindy can do it now. And she can. No surprise there. So Mindy has saved the day. That's wonderful. OK. So um, that just shows you how, how quick and easy it is to manage the grants and, and how visible the entire process is. So let's go on. Oh, I just want to show you this. So this, this kind of just shows you just an idea of where everything was. So the worker nodes were in the shared collection. And then this is what the teams could actually see. So there was um, a uh, no access to everything else. Payments team could do what they needed to do there. Same thing for the mobile team. But then the ops team has access to deploy everything everywhere. OK, 
So let's take this a step further. So the uh, Orca Bank, uh, their guys, right, they went on Hacker News and they read something about DevOps and they downloaded the Phoenix project on his Kindle. And now they decided that they don't want just developers, they want DevOps engineers. So they're going to have their engineers deploy applications themselves um, and the developers are going to be responsible for maintaining that. Um, at the same time, their executives have been reading the news and well, there's a lot of hackings going on. They don't want to end up on the news as well. And so they decided, we're going to segment our applications. We want the, um, the payments team to deploy on a separate set of nodes, and same thing for our uh, mobile team. And we also want to have a database team that manages the state for our applications that's, that's separate. And then maybe the mobile team and the payments team will be consumers of that. Right? So every team will have dedicated nodes. So what kind of collection architecture would we have to do that? So obviously, we're going to keep our system uh, collection. Uh, we're going to have a, a mobile collection just where the nodes are specified, so everything will land in that area. And then the same thing for DB and payments. Um, and then so everything will be scheduled on a separate nodes. Okay, so what's the difference here? Let's, let's take a look at this because there's also some, so a little nuance involved here. What we did is we took all of our application nodes out of the shared collection and then we put them into our own specific custom collections that are attached to the root. Um, and so in this way, we can say this is how we essentially grant uh, access control for nodes, is by taking them out of the shared collection and then putting them in other ones. And then if you grant a scheduling capability, which is its own unique capability, then you can schedule, um, then you can schedule an application on that specific nodes. There is um, kind of a weird thing though here, because let's say, now, I mean, now we have the situation where the database is a provider of a service and then the application teams are the consumer of that service. Um, how would we deal with that kind of situation? Because, of course, we're not granting access to multiple collections in this instance. Um, and so for this, we're going to do something special. And by the way, this is just one implementation. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Collections are very uh, flexible. So in this instance, we'll take the, um, the database nodes, right? We're going to deploy the database uh, or key value store or whatever stateful um, components there. And we're going to create a, co a mo payments collection and a mobile collection underneath it to put those database components in. So what that ends up looking like is, this is kind of an eye, eye chart here, but um, so the mobile collection can get access to their components, um, to their database that they're going to use, but it can't crisscross and, and get access to the payments one. Another thing we're going to use, we're going to use a specific role to allow us to just allow grant access from mobile to the network and the secret. We don't want the the team members in the mobile team to be able to see the container itself or to be able to do anything to the volume or even view the path of the volume or anything like that. But we just want them to be able to connect to the network because that's a shared resource and then use the secret to be able to securely connect to that, that um, database container. Um, and so that's just how we're going to do it. The way that it's done, um, this is again, I actually added the, the Active Directory in here just so we can see everything go across the entire path. So in this case, now we're actually putting two grants against an individual team. Now this, uh, this allows us to give the, uh, the ops team, or the, the uh, development teams to deploy applications uh, themselves into their own collection, but then they can cross over and then use the network and the secret in their specific DB payments and DB mobile collection. And that's because we gave them the role, view and use networks and secrets. So that's all they can do. They can't destroy the network. They can't create new networks in that specific collection. They can just see it and then optionally connect to it, disconnect to it, or use the secret. And this gives them the power to do all of that. Um, so it's very flexible, like I said, um, and I think things can get very complicated if you want them to. I think in a lot of cases, we want to have a maintainable collection architecture. And so it makes sense to think about your organization, to think about the patterns in your applications, who's a consumer and provider of who, where are their shared resources, where they're not going to be shared resources, uh, where, do we want to ac where do we want to separate things by nodes, where, where are they allowed to use common infrastructure. These are all things that I would think about when trying to design this because your grants are very flexible in how we can create and destroy them, but your collection architecture does influence the ways, the ways that you bucketize your resources and put them in different places. So it's very important to think about that beforehand. Of course, grants can be changed and deleted and removed, but if you have something, several hierarchies level deep, depending on something else, it's going to be difficult to change those kinds of things. So going back to 
to this. The resulting architecture is the DB has full domain over their area, so they can do anything from deploy to destroy in their area. Um, the, uh, and then the mobile team and then the other development team respectively can have full domain in their collection, but then just the ability to view and use networks and secrets um, for the database area in their side. So let me just show you guys really quickly what this would look like. So I'm going to bring up a second UCP cluster right now, and this one has more nodes. And let me just make that a little bit bigger. So here I have one UCP controller, right, the top one, and then I have, let me make this a little bit bigger. I have one UCP controller on top, and then I have three nodes underneath that. And then I'm going to inspect one of these nodes just so we can see what we have here. Come on. Spelling is always a challenge for an engineer. And so what we can see here is we have a special set of labels on here, one that denotes this node as it's in the payments collection. So this can be done, we can do this on the CLI, or we can do this in UCP itself, where we place nodes in specific collections. And then when things are actually scheduled on these nodes, that we can see that, um, or that we, can, we can enforce the scheduling of things. And so if I go to my, oh, wrong URL. That makes sense. And so here I am logged in as Mindy, and so I can go to her profile here, and I can see that she has a default collection set. And so we can enforce the collection that people deploy on or the users or teams deploy into to basically say in which areas and in which bucket of resources applications and application resources are deployed in. So I want to leave a little bit uh, for you guys, and so I, I want to bring this up. We have this entire lab set up in the, um, in the Docker hands-on labs. So when you guys get a chance, uh, try this out. You set up your own LDAP uh, container, and then import users, and then go through designing the collection architecture. And so if this is something that you guys think that would be useful for your organization to grant access, um, then you should definitely go, go through this. It'll give you a nice idea of how to configure this all yourself. And um, with that, I also want to say that, let's see here, that we have uh, Docker EE hosted on this website right here, docker.com.trial, with all of the labs that we have. So at any time, you can go on there, get a four free hour demo, you can spin it up. You don't have to spin up any, any infrastructure yourself, um, and then figure out how that all works. So that, the hands-on labs, and uh, that is my talk for today. So thank you very much. Any questions? If you want to walk up to the mic also, that works too. But I'll walk to you. We, we've been setting up uh, organizations with teams. Teams are defined in LDAP. If you want a team in multiple organizations, you have to set them up every single organization. Is there no plan to have a team separate from the organization so that you can just set them up once? There, there is a plan to change the way that teams and organizations map together. It's not, um, it's not defined yet, but that's been a big talk. That it's, it's kind of constraining. So yes. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah, <laughs> we hear you. You want to see the question? You got anything? <laughs> no, actually, I, I did have a question, but you probably don't have to answer it. But uh, is there a way to have the same kind of like nice visual output that you had in your slides where basically I've set up a bunch of roles and I have a bunch of user and be able to actually see it? Yes, so um, UCP right now in the version, they've actually done a lot of enhancements to the UI. Um, the setting up, going through and setting up this whole process is a little complex, and I think they can be seen in the UI because it, it, it leaves some, some uh, to be desired there. So um, in the version that's coming out, they've really revamped the, the flow for you to go through and configure these things. So visually, it's a lot easier to see, okay, what resources are in what collection, and then where does map, how does everything map together?
Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, looking at the collection, uh, basically, uh, we can uh, allow uh, physical separation, assigning uh, a given node or a set of node to a group of users, if I understood correctly, right? Correct. Okay, because this is uh, often needed for compliance reasons uh, when there are several legal entities maybe behind the same uh, hat, so it's needed to separate. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and to be specific, we're not actually assigning these nodes to users, right? We have a separation. There is, they're, they're assigned to the collection itself. And then um, in UCP, we can do things like, of course, the controllers and the workers, they don't need to be in the same networks. And we can segment out the, um, we can use different interfaces for things like, um, like the control traffic and the actual data traffic for containers. And so if you need to have nodes in different security zones and your UCP controllers in a in also a different security zone, then you can use the combination of the out-of-band interface with UCP along with the collections to get a more secure way of segmenting everything. Okay, and uh, just another question uh, about that. Uh, so, defining an organization, basically we can plug as well a different uh, directory behind, so to have um, a different set of users that we, they can be assigned to a given set of resources maintaining the same physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.